today. We are in studio with our uh, co-host from the first half of an hour, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, who was recently uh, referred to as Mr. Stubblefield by Alonzo Perry, who's setting a dangerous precedent. And now Bill says he won't go on unless we all address him as Mr. Stubblefield from this time forward. Or or something, some appropriate difference. Yeah, Alonzo is a good, good man. (laughs) The other three I have more question about. (laughs) Well, out of all the superlatives that we learned to use over the years, there's a couple I'm going to have to eliminate right off the beginning, and one of them is Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> your Honor, Your Honor. That would be the voice. He might of... be judgmental, but he ain't <laughs> no judge. <That's> for... <laughs> Larry Schultz's voice right there from Berkshire's Harmon and Jenkinson. Larry, good morning to you. Good morning. Sergeant Michael Height, the Badger. Good morning. Mr. Alonzo Perry in the Mike Carl seat. Good morning, good morning. And via telephone from the law offices of Mansion Ferretti, Mr. Joe, Joey Toots Ferretti. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everyone. And Joe, welcome back. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be back. Yeah. I actually wrote two intros for you today, Joe, uh, and I like both of them so much I was considering reading both, but I'm not going to do that because that would just seem to be to be a little too stubblefieldian egomaniacal. So I'm just going to... <laughs> <laughs> what brought that on, Joe? <laughs> so, I'm just going to read one of them. I'll save the other one for next week, provided that you'll be here next week, Joe. Will you be here next week? Uh, yeah, it should be. He You're will. not playing golf with some <laughs> VIP, <laughs> are you, Joe? He will be now. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, as I look upon the intros, I see that Larry Schultz is first. You know, it, it, it dawns on me that I should always tell Colin when we have pictures. We don't have pictures this week, but I should tell Colin who goes in order. So he doesn't have pictures to bring up. <laughs> Joe, you missed last week. Last week was the grand finale. It was like the 4th of July fireworks at the 44th minute. We brought out all the old photos last week for everybody. You couldn't, you couldn't oh. uh, answer for yourself. So we had fun with you. I'm and sorry in, I missed that. And, and in fact, Maybe. Joe, it, it stayed up in the background for very, very long. You can look over Larry's shoulder, and there is this picture of you on the beach that stood there for the, much of the show. So every time the camera uh, went uh, panned over to Larry, we saw you instead. It was like uh, Tinkerbell. And uh, do you remember the old Disney, Sunday Night Disney thing, that little Tinker, Tinkerbell yeah. up in the corner? That was you, Joe. I'm not sure I'd call that photograph of, uh, <laughs> of Joe Tinkerbell, but maybe you did. I just did so. Hey. I'm still not convinced that was Joe. A body double? Yeah, yeah. I think maybe we're talking about somebody sh- photoshopped in a model or something. I think uh, Colin actually did that for, for uh, oh, no, that was for Gilstrap. He put uh, Gilstrap's head oh, on Ferretti's so so body. So funny. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty cool, right? All right, here we go. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Now, last Friday was the day of the Badger, we learned. But for one of our panelists, it was a marsupial for which he told us he yearned. Coming up on October the 18th, it's National Opossum Day, which makes Larry Schultz glow like a sunshine ray. If you're playing possum, it means you're not so scary. Well, at least not as much as a Dana Holgerson in Houston Hail Mary. <laughs> Ooh, Ouch. That one hits. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ooh, that hits. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Uh, too soon? Was that too soon? Uh, it's a little too soon. Yeah. <laughs> Was that like was that like going to Mary Todd Lincoln's house in 1866 and asking her how she liked to play? Was, is that is that a problem? Ouch! In Berkeley County, he heads up the Republican Party, and before that, he once challenged Delegate John Hardy. For now, Alonzo Perry operates in relative peace, but just across the county border, civility will cease. I wonder if he ever got in trouble for not taking a voice vote, because in Jefferson County, if you do that, well, that's all she wrote. Yeah, that, that is all she wrote. <laughs> Good morning, Alonzo. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, now, Joe, here comes you. All right. So uh, to do that, i got to break out my buddy, Joe Dolce. I like Joe's intros because I get to work a little Italianism in there every day. Today is the day to recognize some famous people named Joe. Our next panelist, Mr. Ferretti, is one you all know. But there's another named Dolce, born this date in 1947, and he's still alive. He's not quite made it to heaven. He made it big with this song, which helped claim his place. It offers good advice to Trump with its title, I'll Shut Up or You Face. Just to make a lousy buck, not to feel like a fool. 
Anyway, Joe Dolce there. I thought after his Netanyahu comments, it'd probably be pretty good advice to just be quiet for a while for him. Right? <laughs> That's not going to happen. Hey, well, yeah. uh, no. we can dream. Uh, now, Mr. Height, uh, this is the reward Mike Height gets for returning to his space, watching the 49ers kick sand in the Cowboys' face. For two weeks, he was abroad in Italy, you see, while Dallas destroyed the Patriots 38-3. to But that 49ers game was a butt-whooping, and I ain't lying. It was so bad, even Corey Roman was crying. <laughs> but, but there's good news coming as soon as Sunday. Relax, Cowboys fans, because of interims. Height is once again going away. <laughs> Hopefully they'll win. <laughs> that was ugly. It was really ugly. They killed the Steelers. They, they are who we thought they were. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Twas on this day in the year 1775 on Waters Wavy that John Paul Jones was credited with starting our Navy. That's right. 248 years have passed in the blip. 248 years, I'm saying. It's not a boat. It's a ship. We get it. What it must have been like back then, I can't say. But I can ask Bill Stubblefield, what was John Paul Jones like back in the day? <laughs> and, and I can tell you, Rob. I can tell you. We're waiting. What was he like? He was a good man indeed. But, yeah, but he's a small man. Small man. Not a good man. <laughs> well, you know, 250 years ago, it was smaller people. That's right, yep. Yeah. All right, uh, with our uh, leadoff hitter in tow, we go to Joe Ferretti via telephone. Well, Rob, it's hard to ignore what's going on in Washington, D.C. these days with um, what appears to be a rudderless ship in the House of Representatives. And I, I can be accused of perhaps picking on the Republicans, but my gosh, they deserve it in this case. We don't have a Speaker of the House, which, by the way, is third in line in terms of the constitutional uh procedure for succeeding a president and vice president, and we don't have that person in that role. Uh, and in light of what's going on internationally and domestically, uh, I think we need a speaker, and we're hopeful that the Republicans are going to get their act together and give us one, but I have my doubts. And I, I have doubts because I think this dysfunction is years in the making, and I'm wondering today if we have thoughts on how we might address it. If you look at a, a really good article by Charles Cook and the Cook Political Report, highly respected uh, group who really examines congressional politics, they pin this dysfunction on, number one, the fact that we're more tribal in the country. We're more divided uh, now than we have been in quite some time. Number two, they look at the process of gerrymandering and how we set up these safe districts and statistically this is borne out because under uh, pursuant to what the cook report is able to publish regarding uh, competitive congressional districts in this country in 1998 we had 164 competitive seats which means that uh, the, the uh, voting was within five percent either way democrat or republican now we have 82 which is 50% less and just in the span of, of about 25 years. We went from 40% of our congressional districts being competitive now down to about 18%. So there's no turnover, and there's no risk for these people acting out, uh, engaging in performative politics and doing whatever they want to do and saying whatever they want to say. There's no retribution at home. They have no fear of standing for reelection. So – what do we get? We get uh, people who run around to the camera or run to social media, raise money, and we have a situation where they don't want to govern. So how do we get out of this mess? How do we get away from the performative politics? How do we get turnover so that the people in Congress will actually serve the will of the people and not themselves? Uh, we can look at term limits. We can look at reforms on how we draw voting districts. The Cook Political Report indicates that states that have adopted a nonpartisan committee approach to, to drawing congressional districts, uh, the erosion of those competitive districts is much slower in those states than there are in the states which give it to the uh, majority party in their state legislature. So 
I think we've got to look at some solutions here to solve this problem. I think congressional reforms are where we need to go. It's just a question of what reforms we need. So I'm just throwing this out to the panel discussion this morning. What can we do to fix this dysfunction? All right, let's start first with the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Well, Joe, you're you're talking about a long-term question, and which certainly needs to be addressed, but we have a very immediate question as well uh, that's embedded in the problem that you, you've just outlined. Uh, how do we come around the short-term solution? Uh, Steve Scalise said that he did not have support. From all indications, Jim Jordan does not have support. Uh, that takes out the two front-runners. Uh, so, and there's some noise been uh, been generated by some of the Republicans that let's stay away from anyone with leadership experience. Let's go with someone brand new, a uh, breath of fresh air there. Uh, what all that says is that they, at least what we, what we hear, there is no clue which way they're going. And, uh, and yet we're in one of the more difficult, one of the more sensitive times uh, of recent history. We have the Israeli war, we have the Ukraine war, but we have this debt limit, uh, the, uh, the appropriation issue that needs to be addressed. Can you imagine what's going to happen in probably about 30, 35 days from now uh, if the uh, if the continuing resolution runs out, we have the government shuts down, we do not have a House of Representatives to take action on, on anything. We cannot get appropriation bills through. We cannot do a new a continuing resolution. We cannot pass anything because without an elected speaker, no legislative issues can be put before the House and addressed. You can do procedural issues, but not anything of substantive legislative issues. So we're in a quagmire, and uh, and maybe there's something happening behind the scenes that we're not privy to, but until that emerges, uh, we are facing, I think, a constitutional crisis. Larry Schultz. Yeah, um, I'm reminded of... Um Earlier in my my own life, when I was a teenager, complaining at the kitchen table that uh, about something that uh, Nixon or Ford or somebody was doing, and my father saying to me, "Okay, we know what you're against. What are you for?" <laughs> and uh, <laughs> somebody needs than I to say that to these people. I'd have just told my son to shut up, and <laughs> get a job, pay taxes before you complain to me. <laughs> As you may have noticed, that doesn't work so hot. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what are they for? What is Jim Jordan actually for or Steve Scalise or any of these other people? who are, They can't be the leader of the caucus that addresses to people who want to see our entire government crash and burn. There are people out there who don't give a damn about any of those good issues that uh, Bill just raised who want to see the whole thing crash and burn. They're, you know, uh, chaos agents. And these guys, these two guys end up there, and they don't really seem to have a set of issues they would like to win on. Um, the question is, how much money can you make when you don't take a position at all on any of the uh, important issues of the day, but instead say... I'm preserving my right to choose either way at a later date. There has to be a time when that ceases to be as profitable for the individuals as it, it, it's pretty profitable right now. And there has to be a day when that ceases. I can only think that day will come when some giant crisis hits us, when we need to do something. Um, there's just enough people in a narrowly divided Congress, there's just enough people to stop the Republicans from doing anything. Never saw anything like it since I've been watching politics. Does anybody else find it ironic that there are so many Republicans in Congress who are against almost everything the government does, yet they draw their paychecks from the government? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, seriously? Oh, Is yeah. Anybody? I'm a registered Republican, have been for 40 years. I'm just always amazed by people who tirade against government spending while cashing government paychecks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yeah. Mike Kite. 
So I, I'm going to push back a little bit, Larry. I, I could say the same thing about Pelosi and, and the Democrats. What do they stand for? I think a lot of times when they're running things, that they're the same way. It's, it's, it's all about what the Republicans are doing wrong or Trump's doing wrong or whatever. What I find impressive about the Democrats is they will go behind closed doors, hammer out their differences, and come out as a united front. And the GOP just can't seem to do that. Um, and, and I think, you know, we brought up an important um, factor earlier when we said that these races aren't as competitive as they used to be. And I think with modern technology, gerrymandering has become a science um, and it, it has locked in some of these districts and and made uh, some of these individuals almost unbeatable, um, whether it's on the Democrat side or or the the GOP side. And I think when when people aren't afraid of answering to the people anymore because it's been gerrymandered so bad, um, I think you get more and more radicals. And when you get more and more radicals, the, the government becomes more and more dysfunctional. Um, and I think that's what you're seeing on the GOP side right now is there are radical right-wingers that are just there to I don't like the way things have been going for a long time, and I'm just going to disrupt it at every turn. If I don't get my way, I'm taking my ball and going home. <clears throat> you can see it on the local level. You can see it at the national level, and, and that's exactly what we're seeing right now. Alonzo. I kind of look at this in, in a multitude of ways. I mean, uh, Joe's question goes into, you know, the performative politics aspect of it. It goes into, um, you know, the internal strife. And then he's also talking about kind of, um, I guess, the, the, the leadership issue or Hyde saying that, you know, there's a kind of an issue with us being united on one consensus. And so to, I guess, go point by point, I don't think performative politics is an inherent negative. I think that um, by a lot of this um, kind of being surfaced to the public, people want to know what's going on with their government. They want to know why, you know, the price of groceries is so bad, why the price of gas is so high, why is there internal uh, conflicts um, across the world with, you know, Hamas uh, executing certain actions in Israel and Ukraine. This actually raises the overall conscience to where people are talking about government and what's happening in their government. That's participatory. Participatory. That's what needs to happen. Um, the issue, though, becomes if you're a manager and it only takes one person to eradicate you from your management position at your job, chances are that manager is going to be removed. And it's going to take a strong leader to avoid the reforms that have been made for one congressman to vacate the speaker. If anything, the Republican conference should have went back with the 96% consensus for McCarthy and said, we're not going to let this one radical uh, allow the caucus to be disrupted. If 96% of us are in consensus, that should be enough for you know these guys to take a seat. But there was no combating it. McCarthy decided to step down. We're watching the speaker fight now where Scalise is like, well, I'll step down. Jordan says, I don't have the votes. I'll step down. There is a, a, a lack of leadership that needs to uh, be curtailed and in, in something that we need to focus on. Uh, this is not an ideological dispute. This is uh, people being irresponsible and no one, you know, being able to, to kind of rally their caucus with a unified and one step kind of vision. Um, that's just how I feel about this. I don't know how to fix it, but I, I, I do think it's going to require someone to you know, stand out among their peers and say, listen, enough's enough. This is what we're going to do in the affirmative. Bon yeah. Bonus points for using the word performative not once but twice. It's never been used on the show before. Right yeah. there. Facebook. <laughs> okay. Okay, Bill, before you go, it's not a quick, made-up word just like a, physicality. Just a question, because um, we saw some of this on the Democratic side. We saw this with the AOC and the four horsemen over there, and and a lot of disruptive um, issues when when Pelosi was running for speaker. And then they went behind closed doors. They worked it all out, and she came out as a dominant leader. They those four people. They may have they had a little quagmire. They might have said things here and there, but they fell in line. And pretty much that whole Democratic uh, caucus fell in line behind their speaker. Why is it that the GOP can't get there? 
I think, you know, we have a lot of people that are confusing uh, conservatism for like this, like libertarianism, this like anarchy. And I think that there's some uh, semblance of, you know, them not knowing what it truly means to be conservative. I think conservatism needs to be rediscovered and uh, needs to be redefined, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. There's an awful lot absolutely. of confusion as to what it is. You're right. Yeah. Uh, both Mike and Joe uh, mentioned gerrymandering. Uh, Newt Gingrich has given a lot of credit for reforming the, uh, the Republican Party. It's what we know now. But I think the individual deserves the most credit, either to the good or the bad, for reforming our electoral process is Tom DeLay, uh, where he he saw the the – strengths of gerrymandering. He worked on gerrymandering. He brought gerrymandering up to a new state of art that did not exist before. And because, and he got in trouble. He was indicted because of uh, the way he was tinkering too much with the political process. Uh, but he's the one that started the gerrymandering down the torturous road that we're on today. Back to you, Joe Ferretti. Well, I, uh, the, the point made about, well, we're, we're missing leadership uh, to, to, right this ship and, and get the Republicans in line. Uh, that may be partly true, but I don't know that there's a leader out there who could possibly herd these cats and get them all in line. And, and, and so when, when you have folks who, who don't have to compromise on any point because they can go home and count on getting reelected without any, any kind of punishment, from the voters, they're guaranteed to have this seat, uh, no matter what they do, or no matter what they say. It really becomes a, a, a situation where we almost have to look at artificial means of, of trying to get some more uh, variety and, and, and get some more voices heard on a political uh, spectrum. And, and I, I, I don't like the idea of working re, uh, reverse engineering this and, and having you know term limits and stuff uh, be the only way to solve this problem but i'm getting to the point where I, I don't know what else to do other than to force turnover and to and to strip away the incentive that these people have to simply go online and fundraise and and plan for the next election knowing that they really not there's not much for them to have to do uh, or say to get reelected. So I, I, I think the artificial means of, of getting new voices heard, getting new people in Congress, new perspectives, is perhaps the only way we're going to solve this problem. Because otherwise, when you're looking at 82 seats nationwide are now considered competitive, you're not going to have the turnover. These same people are going to be there year after year. And I don't see how we're going to solve that problem. But, Joe, a counter to that is what Mike Height mentioned earlier. Uh, three years ago, maybe two and a half years or so ago, uh, Nancy Pelosi had the same group of renegades in-house that uh, the Republicans have today. Yet, behind closed doors, whatever leverage she used, there was not a dysfunctional group. Whether you like Nancy Pelosi or not, and a lot of people do not like her, you have to give her credit for keeping the Democrats in line. That does not come in with a, uh, the, the electoral process. That comes in with pure, old-fashioned leadership. And, and also so well, she was smart right. enough to not allow a rule that would permit eight angry people right. to upset yeah. the Correct. entire yeah. well, setup. Bill, but let's not forget, she self-imposed her own term limit on her speakership. She made a promise, four years and I'm out. And that resonated with some of those uh, Democrats who, who were unwilling to fall in line. Once she made that promise, they did fall in line. So she actually term limited herself in regard to the role of speaker. And, and I think that's maybe one way we have to approach this as a whole. Term limits now, term limits for everybody limited. and every every position? Is that what you're talking about, or just for uh, leadership positions? I, I think these congressional seats should be term limited. Yeah, I, I, I just I think do. you have to strip away uh, the, the idea that these folks can go there and, and spend 20, 25 years, get rich, and then leave. Uh, you know, it, it's more going back to the roots of, of what our founders envisioned, which was a, a citizen legislature. 
Yes, I'm, you can spend I'm 20 cer- years in Congress railing against government spending while cashing your check. <laughs> I'm certainly glad that rule did not obtain while Robert Byrd was filling the Eastern Panhandle <laughs> with government agencies. <laughs> we got a Coast Guard. <laughs> yeah, we got the Coast Guard. I mean, come on. We don't have a beach. We got the Coast Guard. We got a Coast Guard. And if you got a Coast Guard, you got a Navy. And if you got a Navy, you got an anniversary. Right? We don't even own the river there on the bottom. Friday panelists once again joining us via telephone. Joe, Joey Toots for ready. Good morning again, Joseph. Good morning, folks. In studio, Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Great to be here. Mr. Alonzo Perry. Good morning. Mr. Michael Height. Good morning. And Billy the Kid, Bill Stubblefield. You, sir, are on the clock. I'm on the clock. Issue number two. As I think our listeners know, the uh, the procedure or the process on Friday is that on Thursday we send to everyone our issues so that people can prepare to respond. Well, yeah. I'm on by, throw. By the way, Bill, the, the issues you're supposed to send are your political issues, not your personal problems. <laughs> <laughs> I've been meaning to clarify that with you for the last two years. But, this is not where you yeah. air your dirty laundry. But, but where else do I get a sympathetic? Well, I'm not. Uh, where would I get a captive audience? Yeah. I might as well take advantage of it. Just going forward, I'm just saying. Yeah, edit, yeah. edit, Bill, edit. Oh, gee whiz. That takes a lot of the fun out of here. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I'm going to throw a curveball to my colleagues today. I'm going to raise an issue that I did not give you advance warning. And that deals back with the uh, the war that we have in Israel, uh, the uh, uh, the many ramifications, the uh, uh, the uncertainties, what's going on, how to address the problem. Uh, there is a lot of anger. There is some confusion. Uh, you can just go down the gamut of of issues that's arising. This I don't think anything since nine eleven has hit to the core of of our feelings as what happened last week, last Friday. Friday or Saturday morning, uh, where we had the Hamas come in and murder, uh, horrible, horrible murders of, of Israelis. And then the follow on with Palestine, with Gaza, uh, destroying the Palestine community. So a lot of reasons to, uh, to, uh, feel concerned, nervous, angry, whatever the description. And then on top of that, we have our, ex-president who's running for office waited in by saying that the prime minister of, of Israel doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't like him. The prime minister betrayed him one time. Therefore, he has no sympathy at all for the prime minister of Israel. And then the terrorist group are very smart people. You have to consider how smart they are. Those in the face of what we're trying to do, uh, we hear some uh, uh, some problems with the, uh, uh, and it's more than a problem. I uh, shouldn't have it on the college campuses where opposing groups uh, are taking positions that make us all uncomfortable. But that's democracy. But we have probably the most influential person in our country today, with Donald Trump. You may not like him. Or you may support him, but you have to admit he's exceptionally influential and makes this statement waiting in where he shouldn't have. My question is, is this going to come back and bite him like no other issues has? We all know 91 indictments against him doesn't appear to make any difference. Whatever he says doesn't make any difference. Now, I think, with, but this statement, challenge at Israel, is cutting at the throat of his basic his large base, the evangelicals, who are very much supportive of Israel. So he's throwing stones at Israel in the face of his uh, his strong base. Uh, and we all know that the elections are going to be done by a very, very, very small group of individuals that are more more independent of the views. Is this going to make a difference in the race? Is this going to run different than the indictments that we've seen before? Let's start with the badge at Mike Height. Well, never underestimate Trump's ability to say something stupid. Um, and, and he did this time. Uh, he, he constantly putting his foot in his mouth. Um, and this is just another example. Will it hurt him? You know, I think it will some. That This is a, a very contentious um, war right now. And I think you're right. I think the, the vast majority of Americans support Israel. Um, and this just shows Trump's thin-skinned. 
Um, and anybody that has, you know, gone against him in, in any way, uh, even a little bit, um, is forever his enemy. And, and he, he says stupid things like this. Uh, you know, I think Netanyahu is, is doing a, a good job in Israel, um, in a very, very tough position. Trump's never been in, in a, in a position like Netanyahu. Very few leaders in the world have ever been in the position that Netanyahu is, um, I think the the mistake that Israel makes is um, trying to negotiate with an organization that does not recognize your right to exist, and I, I don't know how you would negotiate with with you know people like that. Um, and as long as as the West Bank and Gaza, uh, the people of those areas allow Hamas or Hezbollah or whomever to come in and, and take over and and um, sort of rule their areas, there's always going to be problems. Um, you know, there have been, this isn't, war isn't new to Israel. There's been several of them. Um, they've controlled the West Bank. They've controlled Gaza before. Why on earth they ever gave it back is, is beyond me. They should have just controlled it um, entirely from then on. Um, you had the war. You, you you took over those areas. Control them, um, and and just you know tell tell the Arab states around you you know we're not going to tolerate this kind of of uh, behavior all the time. So, um, you know, like I said, Trump's an idiot. <laughs> that's your summation. That's my summation. Trump, Trump's an idiot. Now that's a nonpartisan remark. <laughs> Larry, Larry. <laughs> And that's a, Repu- <laughs> that's a Republican Alonzo. speaking. Not with Alonzo. <laughs> that is, that's that's um, uh, my kind. Yeah. You may all recall back when Ukraine was invaded by Russia, Trump referred to um, um, Vladimir Putin as a genius. Uh, fast forward six months or a year, Russia's bogged down. They had 300,000 casualties to only 200 for the Ukrainians. And Trump mentions when someone asks him about it that he thinks Vladimir Putin made a mistake. This is just a guy who's praying to God that you didn't listen to what he said yesterday. Because he's going to adjust what he says to whatever happened today. And, and so it's not a question of, you know, he's lying. It's a question of the truth is not even a consideration. The question is, what is good for me? And so... He will shock people by saying Putin's a genius when Putin turns out to be quite the opposite of a genius and to have underthought this entire thing, he'll sort of pretend he didn't say it or try to back off on it. That's the problem with somebody who doesn't really believe in anything but himself. And if I I might add, I think that's what's infecting the Republican Congress. The same thing. There's a group of people there who don't really necessarily stand for anything except themselves. And so, yeah, he's going to continue to do this for as long as he draws breath. Um, And so it will always be this way. And to sum it all up, Trump's an idiot. (laughs) Right. He will (laughs) deny it each time. And, well, true, he's an idiot, but... um, the rest of us have a responsibility to not be idiots along with them and to Agreed. say, wait a minute, critical thinking, hold on, that ain't what you said last month. Uh, i got to call you to account. We don't, for some reason, we don't do that with him. All right, Alonzo Perry is not laughing. Do you have Trump's back here, Alonzo? <laughs> well, of sure course. he does. Well, of course, because the international order, I mean, is literally on fire. All of the rules-based, you know, international order that we always believe, you know, is, is some veil of security and peace. It's, it's not real. And Trump has shown that when he's in office, this is not the case. Uh, we don't have invasions of Ukraine. We don't have uh, Hezbollah and, and all of these uh, countries surrounding Israel with armaments. You don't have Hamas, you know, uh, uh, storming through, you know, the borders and and using paragliders subsidized by the Biden administration. I mean, this is it's pretty shocking that uh, we somehow think that that Trump wouldn't have, uh, you know, just criticizing him for saying that uh, one of our enemies are smart. I mean, that's like, you know, something that Sun Tzu would do. 
Sun Tzu says never underestimate your opponents. And so uh, Trump understands these individuals. He understands them a lot better than most of the people in the establishment that we have seen operate and run this country. Think about when uh, we were facing with ISIS and um, he sent to the ISIS's leader a picture of his house and let him know that we know exactly where he is. And not only that, but he destroyed ISIS. ISIS doesn't exist as, as a caliphate anymore simply because of the uh, the methods of fighting that, that Trump was, uh, you know, leading us into. The bombing of the Iranian general. All of this stuff is 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 symptomatic or emblematic of Biden reducing America's foreign capabilities to something equivocating uh, a, a paper tiger, as the Chinese would say. And that's the issue. Our soft power sanctions haven't worked. We've reduced our capacity to show the world stage that America is about to do business. Um, and this is the consequence of that. When America's weak, the world is weak. Hey, uh, just to uh, make a note of what Alonzo is referring to, Tuesday, October 10, opinion piece in the uh, Wall Street Journal, the glo growing global disorder is a result in part of American retreat. Not least Mr. Biden's departure from Afghanistan that told the world's rogues the U.S. is preoccupied with its internal divisions. There's more about that, too. If uh, you want to read that, look up uh, Wake Up Washington, review and outlook section, opinion piece of the uh, Wall Street Journal. Mr. Ferretti by telephone. Well, I, Th I Thanks, by the way, to Judy Boykin for dropping that off. I, I don't recall it being all kumbaya on an international stage when Trump was in office. I, I, I seem to recall him sending about 60 Tomahawk missiles into Syria to bomb an airfield after the Syrians uh, engaged in a chemical attack on on their neighbors. Uh, you know, there, there's Middle East conflict, and it, it's constant. And the United States is right there uh, trying to mitigate trying to ameliorate the problem and and uh, this is no different today uh and, and alonso to say that trump understands the the uh, geopolitical theater better than most because he has a penchant for commenting on the intelligence of some of these terrorists is, is I, I don't understand that. I, I mean, this, this guy doesn't understand anything. If you go back and look at the text of his comments where he goes after Netanyahu, solely for the reason that Netanyahu called Biden and, and congratulated him on the win in 2020, there's no policy prescription here from Trump as to what to do for the Israelis. There, there's no grand plan that he has to, to uh, somehow – affect change in the Middle East. He's just spouting off whatever comes to his, his mind, and he makes a joke out of it. And it, it's, it's alarming that people see that as some sort of, of uh, knowledge about geopolitical issues of the day. Uh, it, it, just like he said he could solve Ukraine and Russia problem in 24 hours. That's a joke. He can't solve that in 24 hours. He wouldn't know the first thing to do about it. Uh, so I... I I just think he's meddlesome. I think he's a hindrance rather than a, than being a help towards uh, solving some of these problems. And I, I wake up every morning, thank God he's not in, in office, because I don't know what would be happening at this stage if he was. I don't know if he'd be for or against Netanyahu, given what his uh, comments were. So gives me great pause to, to think he's still on the world stage, uh, having some influence and having some influence in Congress, as Larry said. I hope that dissipates soon. Comes back to you, Bill. Yeah, I do not believe that this will make any, his remarks will make any difference on his base. I do believe, though, on the swing states, the swing voters in those critical areas, it could make a real difference in the outcome of the election. Issue number three, Michael Height. All right, we're going to go um, to uh, my question is, are there similarities in the U.S. House GOP? and the state house GOP with the rise of the Freedom Caucus and even the Jefferson County GOP, which all seem to have factions right now and seem to be in disarray. Right, I'm going to go to Alonzo first on this one as the head of the Republican Party in Berkeley County. I don't see it having any similarities because uh, I think that what's happening in Jefferson County is not so much an ideological dispute, but more of a, uh, a personal kind of uh, conflict. I think, you know, when it comes to, to 
politics, yes, sometimes it's the rubber meets the road on on uh, diverging ideas of how to govern. But I think that uh, so much of what has happened in Jefferson County has started to disintegrate into just uh, – I'm going to get the next person. And there's a long history there, um, you know, uh, starting with probably the EMS issue. And I know you had the West Virginia Observer here on the radio talking about that issue. Uh, but I think uh, one thing to point out is that, uh, or just to let people know where I stand on this issue, I think it is wrong to not attend government meetings. I think that that is a nuclear option. I believe that that uh, creates a, a power that shouldn't exist. And so on. I mean, if you had a, a, a divided uh, group of you know Democrats and Republicans, and one side just decided not to come to the county commission meetings, I think that that's an impro inappropriate use of uh, you know their authority to try to, I guess, stop the proceedings. However, I will say that there is some fundamental issues with administrative staff working with one side of this argument to basically um, do things such as not fund that grant that was about $50,000. I think that was a direct action from uh, the administrative staff taking power that probably shouldn't belong to them either. So uh, no one's right in this situation, um, but I think that they should definitely come to the table and talk to each other. And if I you know, had any sway with any of them in that group um, of both sides, I would say you know, it, the conversation cannot fall out because at that point, you're putting the citizenry of Jefferson County at jeopardy. Joe Ferretti. Bravo, Alonzo. Agree 100%. And I, I for some from perspective on this, I went to a Facebook page, Jefferson County Perspective, and I was amazed at uh, some of the posts on there from the active uh, folks on that page I mean, they're going after Wayne Clark, Paul Espinoza, the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Uh, there's a certain amount of purity that is demanded in these social media websites from some of these politically active people. And I think it's a real danger. I, I just wonder at some point, are they going to define themselves so narrowly that they're really not going to have any constituency? Uh, it, it, there doesn't seem to be anybody who's safe politically uh, in Jefferson County, uh, and, and I, I, I'm just amazed at, at the discourse over there and, and what's happening. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the answer is to it. I don't know how you solve that problem, and I don't even know if a lot of people see it as a problem, but I don't know really if there's ever going to be a consensus over there because it's, it's more than just a freedom caucus. There seems to be different factions over there uh, narrowly defined. And, and probably with just a few members in each faction. And it, it seems to be so splintered that I'm, I'm just wondering if Jefferson County is going to have the kind of government and the kind of representatives that they can all get behind. I, I don't see it right now, at least if, if you judge by that Jefferson County perspective Facebook page. How it gets solved, Joe, is exactly how the Democratic supermajority got solved. And that is eventually people get sick and tired of all of the infighting, and they throw the bums out, and they change governments. They change direction. The pendulum swings, right? It swings. And, and eventually people get disgusted with dysfunction, and they change stuff. And ultimately, supermajorities become their own worst enemies and destroy their own parties, and then they've yeah. got to rebuild them back up. We saw it with the Democrats yeah. not 25 years ago. And now the Republicans are doing it to themselves again. You're right. Eventually, these constituencies will fit inside of a phone booth of everybody who passes the purity test. Right? And we'll all have our own yeah. phone booths. And for those of you too young to know what a phone booth is. And, and I, and exactly. I, and I'm not about to share my phone booth. <laughs> you should, Bill. We would all listen to your issues, remember? That's right. All right. Uh, we go to Mr. Schultz. Yes, it's very difficult to govern from a phone booth where you are by yourself. And we, like in the Congress, which is has developed the way it developed, I think, largely because of gerrymandering, th this is developed a different way, but it's the same outcome. You have a group of people who aren't really looking to necessarily accomplish a specific list of goals. Instead, they want to say, okay, this week here's what we're for, and if we don't have enough votes, we'll just 
make it up and we'll do this and that and we'll work around it and we won't call for a voice vote when the when the statute says we need a voice vote and they're just making a mess part of the reason you wouldn't do that and we don't see that very often is usually the people who want to get things done are very careful to make sure they can get them done legally because they want to get them done i'm of the belief that a lot of these issues are just cosmetic and nobody wants to really get anything done and so they don't care they don't bother to read the rules that say there has to be a voice vote they don't bother or to follow them if they do read them it sounds like they need i hate to make this suggestion given what i do for a living they need more aggressive attorney on the panel (laughs) Who will say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, You've got to have a voice vote. They, Stop. They <laughs> tried, an attorney tried to give an opinion to one of the commissioners who gave a rather terse rebuke to that attorney. Well, but yeah. the voice vote was in the executive committee, yeah. and it had nothing to do with the commission at all. The right. voice vote was. And, and we don't, none of us were there, so we don't know what happened. They, they could have suspended the rules and, and did away with the, the voice vote and said, we're going to do this by secret ballot. I don't know if that's what happened, but it is possible. And it's well within the rules to do that. Yeah. So the the executive committee issue, I think, is a non-starter. But what we're talking about with the um, the actual grant and and those issues, that county attorney, you know, I, I don't, I, I I've went and read the Open Governments or Open Meetings Act, and it doesn't say in there that you cannot have a vote via email. And I think that that interpretation of it was him taking an undue power or undue authority that was given to him. I think that that's a a lot of the problem with federal government, right, is we have these administrative positions where these people are usurping uh, more authority than what is actually given to them. That grant could have gotten passed. So I I didn't like that there was a, you know, uh, what I believe to be a political hit on uh, the two commissioners, Krause and and Jackson, in that regard. But and I look at it this way. They're fighting something that they believe is existential because if the next guy is appointed, they know they will be back into the minority and uh, they won't have you know the influence or, or authority to stop what they believe is the county going in the wrong uh, direction. Now, what's funny about the terminology, though, Alonzo, is other than Jane Tab, it would still be an all Republican county commission, and to say that those two go back into the minority is. It's kind of funny because it is an all-Republican county commission. Well, I mean, loosely translated. And, and, uh, Other let's, than Jane let's think, let's think about this, too, <laughs> which is another thing that I, I criticize, which uh, I hope legislators go and rewrite in the code. But why does Jane Tapp get to strike a name from the actual uh, people that were uh, no, given by the, no, the, right. yeah, by the executive committee? She's not a Republican. She's an independent. That part of the code needs to be rewritten. If if there's senior Democrats on the uh, on the actual county commission, would they be able to strike Republican names sure. that are given to uh, you know? That's ridiculous. Yeah. So uh, yeah. that's one of the critiques I had when Steve Salifer was on the program uh, last week. But uh, nonetheless, the way that this gets solved is by them showing up to work. Ha- unfortunately for them, uh, the Keith Lowry will be put in his position, and then we can continue as business as usual. Because I, I feel like there's a lot of unintended consequences that are uh, probably down the pipe if this situation does not get solved. Admiral, we're running short of time, so I'll make my answer very quick. One to answer to, uh, Mike's question, are the similarities? I think there are similarities between the U.S. GOP House and uh probably less so with the uh, state uh, house and certainly with Jefferson County um, uh, County Commission. Uh, so yes, there are similarities. I think there's one thing to have in common, the, the unwillingness to compromise. It's got to be my way or it's going to be the proverbial highway. Back to you, Mr. Hyde, for the final word. Uh, yeah, I'm going to agree with Bill. I think there are similarities, and I think people don't see it yet in the the, the state house. Yeah. Um, but with the rise of the Freedom Caucus and and what those individuals stand for and what they want, they are pushing the radical right, um, and they are growing in numbers. Um, I, I've heard they're as high as 24 right now. Um, so. I think there are similarities. You see the same thing in the the, the national, the U.S. House of, 
um, of, of Congress. So I think there are very, uh, maybe not so much with Jefferson County, but with those two houses, I do see a lot of similarities. All right, I make a motion. We adjourn for the commercial break. Can I get a second? Everybody, yes. Votes, <laughs> voice votes not permitted. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it not being a voice vote was the issue, Larry. That was the entire issue where we stand right now. Larry, do you want to suspend the rules? Is that okay? <laughs> Let's go ahead. Let's uh, toss them out the window. Uh, uh, the adjournment is uh, in limbo. We'll have to stay here until we get further approval. This Ah, uh, there you go, there, Popeye. Uh, today marks the date, 1938. E.C. Seeger passed away. He's the guy behind Popeye. I actually thought when I was a little kid, if you ate spinach out of a can, you would get big muscles, or at least big forearms. <laughs> Popeye had pretty puny biceps, if you think about it. He had these gigantic forearms, yeah, forearms. and then puny biceps. Little elbows. Must have just done you. Tiny little bony elbows. <laughs> Honest build. This segment of our program today brought to you in part by our friends at the Wagner Law Firm, West Virginia's premier DUI defense attorney, West Virginia DUI Lawyers dot com is how you reach Harley Wagner, and also by our friends at the Locust Hill Golf Course. Wayne Clark and Company have a new membership drive going on right now. You get the rest of this year and all of next year. You save five hundred bucks. Call the Locust Hill Golf Course Golf Shop today at three zero four seven two eight seventy three hundred or stop by at two seventy eight St Andrews Drive in Charlestown. Issue number four, and for that, Larry Schultz, you're on the clock. Yes, um, I found that by the time uh, Mr. Scalise finished with uh, his actions last night, and we went through Bill and and the other ones, that all my Issues have already been discussed, so I'm just going to flatly steal one from Bill. In light of Humas' attack... This is what leads to Bill's issues, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a lot of them. Well, it's, it's difficult when you come from an authoritarian career. Dictatorial, some would say. Yeah, some would say. Uh, most of them are in the brig, he said. In light of Humas' attack on Israel, what should the U.S. do in regard to Iran? Oh, good question. Um... Iran, there's no question, at least, you know, they've gone back and forth publicly over the last few days about how much involvement there is. But clearly there's there's a connection between uh, Hezbollah or Hamas and uh, Iran. And we now have six billion dollars of Iran's money that we're talking about returning to them. I'm not sure that we're going to do that right away now. Um, but did. what does the panel think that we should do about Iran? Well, let's start first with oh. Delegate Mike Height. Um, you know, I think the Biden administration has recognized that they made some mistakes with Iran early on, um, and that now they're trying to correct them. As as far as that six billion dollars, um, the last I heard that they have coordinated with Qatar to freeze that six billion dollars so it's not accessible by Iran anymore. Um, so, you know, the the whole cozying up to Iran and uh, allowing them to have funds, now you can see where those funds were going. They, they, they've used the, that extra money to, to support Hamas, to support Hezbollah, and to provide them with, with weapons of mass destruction to, to fight their war um, by proxy on Israel. Um, and, it, you know, as much as I say Trump's an idiot, he was smart enough to realize that that's what was going to happen when you cozy up to Iran. And and I, I think you can see a lot of um, a rise in, in instability around the world because we have taken what I consider a weaker position um, as as a government in the United States um, with all these, these dictatorial uh, governments around the world. So I, I think like I said before, Biden administration has recognized that maybe they made a mistake in a sort of backtracking um, their support of Iran and, w and what their their interaction with Iran. Billy. Yeah, uh, it's awful difficult to cut this Iran uh, issue into black and white. There are so, so many grays. There's been an, uh, a philosophy among the, within the federal government for the last many years, less so today than it was, uh, say, 20 years, 20, 30 years ago, that we develop economic 
treaties, if you will, that we avoid open conflicts. Uh, we keep everything, may not be happy with, among the various camps, but we keep it at a management level. Uh, and that's the direction we were going with both the Republican and the Democrat administration until Trump came in and said, I don't like Iran. Every treaty, every understanding that we had is by the book, uh, is, is down the drain. And some historians, some uh, uh, individuals study this much more closely than I do, says that is the root of the Iran, uh, Iranian problem that we have today because of this very precipitous action that Trump had. We had everything under manageable control until Trump came in, and now it's not manageable. Iran's influence with uh, uh, Hezbollah and uh, Hamas, probably it's very, very, very real. We have no reason to think otherwise. Uh, supposedly, though, Iran was caught off guard uh, the same way that the U.S. and Israel was uh, last Friday when uh, the uh, Hezbollah attacked. Uh, supposedly, Iran did not see that coming. So did they promote this particular uh, raid? Who knows? But the, obviously they have aided and abetted Hamas and Hezbollah over the years. Joseph. There I am. Joseph. Well, uh, the first thing that we need to do with Iran, I think we've already done, which is park the USS Gerald R. Ford off the coast in the Mediterranean, uh, ready to respond to anything that Iran does or, or their proxies, such as Hezbollah in, in, uh, in Lebanon. If, if there's a second front opened up on, in this war with Israel, I suspect the U.S. will respond in, in a very assertive way. And that, uh, that carrier off the coast will be instrumental in that response. So that's the show of force is necessary to signal to Iran and other bad actors that the U.S. Uh, will not tolerate any uh, mischievous conduct on the part of these other countries. Uh, and then secondly, yeah, the, the funding mechanism that exists between Iran and, and Hamas and Hezbollah is well known and established. And, and, and so you, you continue to sanction and starve Iran as much as you can in terms of funds and, and money. Uh, unfortunately, they're a big exporter of oil, and a lot of countries need that oil, and it's hard to address uh, you know, how you, you stop those countries from purchasing Iran oil, much like it was hard to address how you stop countries from purchasing Russian oil. Uh, so it, it's a vexing problem in terms of the money. Uh, I think the move to, uh, as Larry mentioned, to perhaps uh, keep that $6 billion in Qatar rather than having some of that money be released or Iran is a step in the right direction. All right, uh, let's go to Larry. Uh, yeah. The, the, oh, did we get around the table all the way yet first? No. I thought oh, go, Alonzo, good. go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I'll keep it real simple. Um, I, you know, we've terminated federal laws to build a border wall, right? And uh, credit to Joe Biden for finally following in Trump's footsteps. But we, you know, we need to ramp up our energy production. This right now, we should terminate a couple federal laws to uh, fill up our strategic reserves. I think we should activate the War Production Act and build up America in a, in a way that the world has never seen and use that as a deterrent because uh, Iran's working on their nuclear program and I'm not sure exactly I know that the the, the deal that we had beforehand was a non-starter uh, I don't think it actually prevented them from developing a nuclear weapon we give uh, Israel you know the capabilities to uh, heighten their uh, espionage and and that's got to be the, the way that we're uh, operating, you know, strengthen ourselves because there's a bumpy road ahead. Any final words from anybody else? The Can evil of what Hamas has done is best described by looking at Gaza City and at, at the Gaza Strip where a couple million largely Palestinian people live underneath which is a network of tunnels where Hamas is. So literally, to get to this enemy, we're going to have to kill a bunch of people who are basically hostages living in their own homes. And that's a very difficult thing. When I say we, I mean the, the, the forces that would like to see Hamas destroyed are going to have to destroy a large part of Gaza. 
and they've set it up that way. Yeah. Going back to uh, Alonzo's point, uh, during that treaty with Iran, uh, the international community did have access to Iran's nuclear capability and what they were developing. So there was access that we no longer have. You disagree, Alonzo? Uh, I'm sorry. What, one second. What would you say? I missed it. It's okay. He, basically, he was refuting your point in saying that the, the, there was access to Iran's nuclear weapons. It was under control during the previous treaty. It was not. And, and the terms of that treaty was uh, built on, like, a promise, a wish. And, you know, if wishes were fishes, we'd all cast nets. Um, so much of what, you know, the the – the ability for them to train nuclear scientists and to operate in facilities being put into the ground that I, that we know are there. Uh, I mean, we have the capabilities to, to view thermal technology. And so we can see when heat is, is pointing at, at certain areas. And we know that they're developing their program. I don't know to what extent or how far their program has been uh, exceeded, but that treaty was not uh, it's it's not congruent with reality. No, it, it gave access. That's my point. It well, gave access ex, uh, access for international inspectors to look at those. But facilities. Bill, it gave access to what they allowed access to. No, and I think that's the point that he's trying to make. There there were a lot of access they weren't giving. They they were saying no to. They were giving access to the places that they said you can have access to this and this and this. But they weren't giving just flat out access. Uh, is my impression, Mike. For a while, they did have. I don't know at the tail end. I cannot answer that. But for a large part of that treaty, they did have full access. Uh, anybody else have a final comment before we go back to Larry? Joe, you good? I'm good. All right, Larry. Um, it, there's a lot of um, consternation by people who support the Palestinians who say, you know, um, yes, Hamas is bad. But are we going to kill two million of them to get to Hamas? Are we going to destroy these people's right to live uh, in order to stamp out this evil? And so this is a really difficult uh, thing to weigh. And there will be more, not fewer, protests on college campuses in favor of those Palestinians. I, I think we can count on that. Issue number five, Alonzo Pepe. Actually, I do want to talk about college campuses. So, uh, and this is something that I wanted to ask. Uh, in light of nationwide pro-Palestine protests during, you know, the horrific attack in Israel, can we finally admit that turning our universities into activist training camps is a bad idea? All right, let's go right back to Larry Schultz on that one, Larry. Um, I hesitate to put it this way, but not for long. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> We need more Americans who stand up for what they believe, not fewer. We need more Americans who know how to peacefully raise their issues without destroying everything around them and say, I disagree, and here's my reason why. Um, more of that would make us a better country. Um, do we need huge, violent uh, protests? No. But... A uh, peaceful protest is the way that change comes about in the United States of America. It's the thing that drives it, especially when you have a Congress made up of a good number of people and even some on both sides who don't really care about the issues at all and are just looking to get reelected. Um, that is the way we do it. That is the way that this former uh, slave country managed to set up a system of civil rights that guarantees every person, regardless of the rate, uh, of their race, the right to vote, and all the other issues as well that, that went along with that. So that's how we do it here. Delegate Mike Height. Um, I'm going to agree with Larry, I think, that the, the universities have always been where we've debated these things out. But to that end, you know, Alonzo's right that these universities the debate is no longer being debated it is is there is an indoctrination and there is censorship on one side or the other if it doesn't agree with agree with the indoctrination that you're getting from these uh, liberal universities so Larry, I agree with you. If you can open it up to both sides and have these debates like we used to have these debates on college campuses where there is the right 
representing a, a side, and there is the left representing a side, and we can come together and debate both issues. But that's not what's going on in universities right now, and I think that's what Alonzo is is alluding to, that that's not what's happening on these campuses right now. All right, now, Mr. Joseph Ferretti, via telephone. Well, I, I would think, by and large, it's legitimate political discourse that's going on in the college campuses. Uh, I think as that term was loosely used to describe January 6th, I think that would apply to what's going on in the uh, college campuses too, I think. But, uh, yeah, I, I think both Larry and, and Mike great, make great points. Uh, it, universities have long been an incubator for the political conscience of this country. Sometimes it goes awry, okay? I don't like that students were spitting on our Vietnam War veterans in the 60s when they returned home. Uh, but yet they had very valid points uh, about the Vietnam War that ultimately shaped this country's des desire and intent to get out in 1973 and 74. Uh, and I think today the same thing can happen. Now, sometimes it goes to the extremes, and, and you, you could be very critical of uh, – the university campus gatherings and and sometimes the decisions made to, to not allow certain speakers to speak on campus and all. Yeah, I, there's reasons to to uh, be concerned about that. But overall, I, I don't think there should be efforts to stifle this or to even admit that, uh, that what's going on on college campuses is all bad. Uh, I think there's some good and some bad there, just like there are uh, in any other forum where political issues are discussed and uh so I, I just as it is for every american in every venue uh, it's up to us to be educated and weigh the the messages that are being delivered and decide for ourselves what's good and what's bad admiral bill stubblefield yeah and democracy can be messy at times our first amendment though ensures that everybody has the right of freedom of speech and what we see, what I saw on national television the last few days, there were an equal number of protests on both sides of this issue, not one way. Now, I have not been in a university classroom for the last several years, so I don't know if all the, class, all the political debate is stilted one way or the other. I doubt very seriously if it is. I think most universities try to promote as much freedom of thought as possible and as much innovative discussion as possible. So I suspect there's a, most professors I knew and I know some of them still today uh, they're looking for trying to promote the students to think for themselves which would encourage open debate. So I don't buy into this premise it is a one way discussion and that the uh, freedom of uh, speech is being extended to one group and stifling the other group. I certainly think some colleges would encourage more of the liberal bent some with more the conservative bent. And uh, we see that with Liberty, a more conservative. We see more liberal probably with Harvard. Uh, but I don't, I, I see this as a healthy discussion. If you go back prior to the Second World War, it was the the college campuses that were promoting first our isolationist view and then our acceptance, we've got to do something. So that's let, give well, credit to the young folks. Uh, not too many years ago, I paid for an economics course that uh, my oldest son was taking in, on a college campus. And when it came time to the study of economics, uh, they explored all the different systems of economics out there. However, the professor himself was preference, uh, preferred socialism and made it clear to his class that socialism was the best form of economics. Well, that to me is not teaching economics. That's proselytizing socialism. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to study all the different forms of e economics and let the students come to their own conclusion as to what's the best form, that's one thing. But I was pretty pissed off to find out I was paying for a professor to try to indoctr my, indoctrinate my son into socialism. And I remember my economics professor was very, was, uh, very much of a capitalist, and anything else was uh, was unacceptable. I think I don't think you can paint everybody with the same same paintbrush, Rob. For just your experience. Well, I didn't, your I'm not saying the entire college system was geared to it. I'm telling you that it does exist. Though. Oh, I, do, I I don't doubt that at all. I th I'm sure it exists, but I'm saying there's more of a. I got to go back here. to Alonzo for a final word here, and then we get to our last break, Alonzo. Well, I'm just going to say that, you know, outside of the University of Wisconsin, the kids chanting glory to the murders uh, with pride flags and everything shows them 
it just shows that these kids do not understand the beliefs that are being espoused throughout the world. 